Good night, good night, good night. Thank you all for tuning in to Alternate Views. I want to say how happy I am to be here with you yet again. Um, please let me know if my audio is fine. So far we have 20 persons on board. Um, thank you for sending in. I welcome to Alternate Views on this Thursday, March 28th. Um, anyone who's listening so far, please let me know if my audio is clear so that we can proceed from there. But the night to you all and welcome. First, let me issue an apology for last week's show. And we had to cancel at a very last minute due to an unforeseen circumstance. Uh, however, we are back here this Thursday and we want to apologize for that inconvenience. Um, nevertheless, we are here to get the day again. Um, March 28th, and we want to welcome you all to Alternate Views. Uh, let's not forget the like program, let's not forget to share Alternate Views. <clears throat> yes, somebody is saying that I'm getting some static. Uh, I totally understand. Yes, that should be better right now. Um, yeah, so again, thank you for tuning in to Alternate Views. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. I see so far we have Galbez, uh, Victoria Screen, we have Marcia, Doria Clark, Judith Ann Clark. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to Alternate Views. Um, this evening we'll be discussing the <clears throat> budget and having a discussion uh, after the budget, you know, Previously, we had one before the budget. Uh, tonight, again, it will just be me and you guys um, having this discussion tonight. Um, we don't have any any guests, um, which is fine. I like to chat with you one-on-one, uh, -on -one so I get to expand upon your questions. Um, so let's have a good night again. We'll be discussing uh, some of the content of the Prime Minister's budget. Uh, so I want to welcome you all, welcome you all um, into Alternate Views, and let us have a good show. I am seeing Sir Alfred Benjamin. Uh, welcome to you, Sir Alfred Benjamin. I'm seeing Deanna Husbands, welcome. I'm seeing St. Ches, uh, welcome to you guys. Uh, Alternate Views, as you know, we're here every Thursday, and we want to have a very good discussion this evening as to what was offered to Barbadians in the budget. As you know, Economy Thursdays is our thing. We do economic analysis. Um, we provide columns. We have our book, Alternate Views, which was built off the first budget. <clears throat> and for those persons who have a copy of Alternate Views, you could see clearly in Alternate Views that we predicted uh, some of the stuff that's included in this current budget. Uh, as you know, there are many policies which were rolled out in the first two budgets, which were not uh, met as yet. Uh, so we're going to discuss all of that tonight, tonight, tonight. So welcome to you all yet again. <clears throat> uh, so far, we are seeing 50 persons. Uh, so let's not forget to, to share the program. Um, we, we take your questions. As always, I take your questions. So... Let's not forget that if you have any questions, please send them in, send them in. That is what I am here for on Alternate Views. Um, I'd love to say good night to the Caribbean Progress Studies Institute and its executive director, Mr. Rashid um, Griffith. Um, very soon you'll be seeing some information coming out from the Caribbean Progress Studies Institute uh, surrounding uh, the budget as well so this is probably this is just a preliminary uh publication uh coming out on a series of publications surrounding barbados's budget uh we'll be highlighting the good aspects we'll be highlighting the not so good aspects we'll be highlighting the aspects which were promised but not delivered and we're hoping that um you can give your feedback as an international audience as we have our barbadians from all over the world we have uh, locals, we have Barbadians in Canada, now uh, we have uh, Barbadians in Brooklyn, New York, as Sir Alfred Benjamin there, we have 
persons from the UK, we have persons watching from Spain, uh, all across Europe and in the South Americas as well. Um, so welcome again to Alternate Views. As we said earlier, uh, we are discussing the budget, having a post-budget talk. Uh, so what I want to do <clears throat> to start, I want to show you or give you an introduction of what the prime minister would have said in the budget that we had very recently just last week and to hear just the introductory part of it uh coming directly from the parliament uh, what we also want to get is uh some of the responses from the opposition leader of uh barbados and what we want to do is to get some feedback directly from the people so i am going to click on something here and I'm going to play the introduction of the Prime Minister's budget so that we can hear uh, what was offered to Barbadians and then we can have some discussion and let's look at what the opposition leaders say. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is good to see you this afternoon, smiling as you are. And let me say at the outset of this second reading speech and the budgetary proposals that I would like to thank all honorable members on this side for the sterling effort over the last few weeks with respect to outlining the plans and programs of the various ministries of this government. In, in, indeed, sir, in following the tradition of previous minister, prime ministers and ministers of finance, this is the time at which I now get to bat my hand. Sir, this afternoon's budget will be a conversation with Barbadians about where we have come from, where we are now, and where we go next, and of course, how we get there. It is a budget that will secure our Barbados of today and our Barbados for tomorrow. That security is anchored on our achievements against many odds so far, on the clear improvements we are seeing, and on the bright light of our rising star, which is the result of our joint effort. It illuminates a future prosperity in which we can all share, and a country in which our pride remains fully justified. Because, Mr. Speaker, it is built on our industry. In this budget, all Barbadians, whether at home or abroad, will see how their efforts can further contribute to the shared national prosperity, how all of us can benefit from our labor to enjoy our share of that prosperity. The Barbados Star will continue to rise through the collective effort of all of our people. And together, sir, we will fully emerge from the period of deep economic and financial abyss with its political origins, of course, in the last decade of 2008 to 2018 from the social and economic tentacles of COVID-19 pandemic, and from the supply chain shackled by the Russia-Ukraine war and its consequences are now compounded by the war in Gaza. We can go into a period, sir, of increased social stability and heightened and sustainable growth. But Mr. Speaker, we must work together and we must plan together. Let us therefore reason together, sir. In order to put you into a listening mood, let me say as early as I did last year, there will be no new taxes. But I am telling you up front that I will warn you that there will be some adjustments during the course of this year of a few rates that we will need the public to be able to bear if our services that depend on those rates are to keep up with the kind of service that Barbadians want. Let me also make the point, sir, that I'm well aware that there are some issues which are of further concern to the country. I hear you, and I see you, and I feel you. The allegation of unsustainable national debt, the cost of living, the healthcare system, and more specifically, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the state of the roads, particularly the pothole repair, 
the access to jobs, especially for our young people, and of course, the management of the education transformation effort. I will address these as I speak to you today, sir. My second mood setting point is to give the country first the facts and second, an assurance about the national debt. I do not take these things lightly. Because so much has been put abroad to convince the country otherwise, I need to make the point, sir. Barbados's debt is not galloping out of control. The debt to GDP ratio is not precarious. And this Barbados Labour Party government has not increased the national debt to unmanageable levels. In fact, sir, the national debt is now lower than it was when we came to office in 2018. <laughs> lower, I can spell the word L-O-W-E-R. When we came to the office, sir, the debt was 178.9% of our GDP. At the end of February last month, 2024, it was 114.6%, Mr. Speaker. In 2018, when we came to office, debt cost this country 68 cents out of every dollar of revenue. Today, we are now paying 30 cents out of every dollar to service debt. <laughs> Sir, the reduction in our national debt has been despite the fact that we went through the worst pandemic in 100 years. Despite the extreme weather events, the worst hurricane in 65 years, the worst freak storm in our memory, and Mr. Speaker, an ash fall that was the worst since the 1902 volcanic eruption of Sufre in St. Vincent. Mr. Speaker, in spite of all of the things that required citizens' support, an occasion high expenditures against shrinking government revenues in those days, and in spite of war caused supply chain disruptions and price increases, Mr. Speaker, our debt has been lower. And Mr. Speaker, let me put this in further context too. And there's a beautiful graph, three graphs that I hope will be shared with the public of Barbados that shows the story very clearly about the management of this economy since 1976. And who increases debt and who brings government down who, who, who allows growth in this economy to take care, take place. And I hope it will be shared, sir. In 1994, when the Barbados Labour Party became the government under the then ONR, the debt stood in this country at $2.5 billion. 14 years later, when we left office, sir, at the end of December 2007, we left a few weeks into January, the debt stood at $7.2 billion. Owen Arthur carried it from 2.5 to 7.2 in 14 years. Mr. Speaker, under the Democratic Labour Party government, not only in the 10 years did our debt mushroom, not only did we record 23 downgrades, but we became the third highest indebted country in the world. And therefore, this talk now about debt really amuses me. Because we all know and we saw the consequences of the debt that the DLP left us in. Indeed, sir, we all know what the position was with respect to, 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 to all of the matters from the South Coast to the buses to all of the things that I don't need to repeat. Sir, when the Dems left the office in 2018, <laughs> the national debt, inclusive of the arrears, stood at a whopping $18.1 billion from $7.2 billion where they inherited it. Mr. Speaker, that is what they did. And Mr. Speaker, they took an economy from us in 2008 that was a $9.6 billion economy in 2008. And you know what they gave us back in 2018, sir? an economy at $10 billion. In other words, when we say that the economy stagnated, these are the facts. And given all the talk about debt, do you know where Barbados's debt stands today, sir, in absolute numbers? Mr. Speaker, our debt at the end of this month, February, that's just gone, 
12.859 billion dollars down. Sorry, that's what we carried it down to. To 12.859 billion when we restructured the debt. You know where the debt is today, sir? 14.9 billion. In almost six years, we have only increased the debt of this country by 2 billion in spite of going through all of the challenges that I just spoke to you that are challenges that this country did not face in 65 years and 100 years. Mr. Speaker, these are the facts. And I want to remind you, sir, that this government remains fixed on our determination to reduce our debt down to 60%, and we hope to be able to do so by 2035, or if we negotiate with our international partners by a soon date thereafter. Sir, this information is critical to understanding what is happening in this economy and what our real growth prospects are. And grow we must... No, no, people. Let me just say that I played that clip on there so that you can hear for yourselves exactly what we're critiquing tonight. Um, I just had to let you hear it for yourself. So I took out some important themes. I took out some important themes out of her budget and and attempting to give you the public uh, understanding. Now, I want to play a clip right i want to play a clip that was taken uh from the opposition leader of barbados and he spoke to <laughs> he spoke to some interesting developments this is a short clip i'm going to try to play them play them one by one but he spoke to something that was happening about the consultants right uh, so this this was what was his response on featured on the news and many of them have not recovered that causes the suffering of thousands of barbadians who could have been employed with the same monies that support those few who live luxurious and opulent lives at the expense of the people that this government sent home last year and many of them have not recovered five hundred dollars a week without national insurance they wanted the money they needed the money but they wanted some respect as well is it too much for them Yes, I already have one more clip. I have one more clip that I want to play for you. Um, just giving you some responses from the leader of the opposition um, to be able to balance the discussion. Um, so I want to play another clip. And this is the leader of opposition's uh, query about the allocation of funds from the, to the prime minister's office. So I just want you to hear this clip. It is wrong. It is wrong to give $188 million to the Prime Minister's office and give $104 million to a department that is dealing with welfare checks. A department that is paying rent for a woman who has two children and no father present in their lives. A woman who has three children going to school after eating something called ramen. If the economy is so buoyant, if the place is a buzz, they use the language that the Prime Minister used yesterday. Show the poor people of this country, show the middle class people of this country. Yes, people. No, <clears throat> I played those clips from the leader of opposition. I would like to play uh, the entire 
very hard to opportunity to However, we just play those clips for conversational purposes because you want to zero in on what was actually said from the, the Prime Minister. Now, <clears throat> no new taxes. Let's start here. And I just, I started it because Mr. Adrian Hayes mentioned it in his comment. Uh, when you hear the term no new taxes, we jump at that. People will celebrate like at least, whoa, um, the government is not taxing us anymore. <clears throat> but the Prime Minister said in the budget that although there is no new taxes, that does not signify that there will not be increases in the current set of taxation. Right? <clears throat> um, you and I both know the taxes we pay as average Barbadians. Um, there were some taxes that were rolled out previously uh, in, in the first IMF work plan. Right? So you all can remember and if I forget any, y'all can give them to me. There's the <clears throat> fuel tax, gas tax. Then there's the garbage and sewage tax. Then there's the fact that VAT was increased from 15% to 17.5%. Right? Then there was the health levy that is deducted through the national insurance. Right? So, so there are a few taxes that, that Barbadians have on them. And the Prime Minister did not indicate, so she spoke about increases in natural gas, but a large set of the population is not connected to natural gas per se. Right? So we are set to see an increase in some of the current taxes. Um, she did not specify clearly which ones uh, will be increased uh, however i can assure you that based off the fact that we are in the imf program they will seek to increase the more lucrative taxes the ones who can yield more finances so the garbage and sewage tax can possibly yield more finances for government the fuel tax could possibly yield more taxes for government the departure tax which funds the BTMI, and I heard uh, Ryan Walters asking for specifics as, uh, this is Senator Ryan Walters asking for specifics on how the BTMI is funded. And to expound upon that point, the BTMI is funded by the departure tax, or we we'll call it the, the, the hotel room tax, where the government tax tourism under the BERT program. So they say that every person leaving the airport and coming in you have to pay some type of departure tax so it was a fee for caricom residents and then there was also a fee for international travelers right and that money's is funding the btmi as we speak but the concern <clears throat> that should have been raised to further mr Ryan walters's point is that why are these taxes not just the tax funding the BCM money but the sewage tax and the fuel tax where are these taxes that were rolled up by the government under the first work program where are they being funded off budget hey right? where are they being funded off budget so off budget meaning that we cannot really see or account for how much money these taxes are really and truly making so the garbage and sewage tax Y'all know that the garbage and sewage tax is set to be collected when you pay water bills at the Barbados Water Authority. The garbage and sewage tax was set up to finance two state owned enterprises in agreement with the IMF. So those two SOEs would be the Sanitation Service Authority, which is supposed to get a dollar and twenty-five cents. This was to be able to buy garbage trucks. And the other component was to be able to fix the sewage problem. As far as we know, the sewage problem is set to be fixed. As far as we know, our garbage trucks came into the island and it was announced that the sewage tax was intended to be a temporary 18 month tax. But as you can see at this point, the sewage tax is still being imposed after the 18 month period 
according to what the authorities or the government suggested. The danger with the garbage to sewage tax and the illegality of it, because it's so, garbage and sewage tax is being illegally collected and illegally applied to Barbados, is that you are telling the Barbados Water Authority, an entity that has not produced financial statements for umpteen years, that cannot give an adequate or, or, or a timely account for its finances, i.e. producing financial statements. You are allowing, according to Dr. Clay Masco, $80 million a month in garbage and sewage tax collection. Right. So according to Clay Masco, the garbage and sewage tax collects $80 million a month, and that $80 million a month is collected by the Barbados Water Authority. And then it is supposed to sum or the uh, majority, the dollar and 25 cents out of the garbage and sewage tax is supposed to be going to, to sanitation. However, it was revealed that the Barbados Water Authority is not paying over that salvation over to sanitation, hence the reason why sanitation is suffering financially. No, it was admitted, admitted later on by the general manager of the Barbados Water Authority that he was using the funds collected from the garbage and sewage tax to be able to manage and run the, data, the affairs of the Barbados Water Authority because the government going through pressure from the International Monetary Fund to cut what they call transfers or cut salvation coming from central government, giving it over to the state one of the presidents to be able to manage the day-to-day -day functions. The MF is saying you have to cut those ministerial allocations, right? So as you, when you really peel back the layers from the garbage and sewage tax, you will see that there's no accountability in the garbage and sewage tax because one water authority is not a tax collection agency, the Barbados Revenue Authority should be collecting the garbage and sewage tax, however, they are not. And then the fact that the Barbados Water Authority does not produce financial statements. Um, how can you account for that? The third layer is that the Prime Minister, in the recent changes, has now taken over the Barbados Water Authority and included it in her ministerial portfolios, right? So if you, under, you understand where I'm, I'm headed uh, with this conversation. So, so there's zero accountability as it relates to the collection of the garbage tax. Now, if the prime minister decides to increase the garbage and sewage tax, which document, which paper, which government official can we reference the amount of garbage and sewage tax collected without depending on the government's economic advisors such as the Clay Maskell and the others. We cannot. So therefore, for the Prime Ministers to possibly increase the garbage and sewage tax would be absurd because right now the rate that is being charged, according to Dr. Clay Maskell, it is collecting $80 million a month. So with that level of finance running through the Prime Minister's office, there's a greater need for accountability for the garbage and sewage tax. The fuel tax in itself, no. The fuel tax is not collected by the Barbados Revenue Authority. Right? It is not collected by the Barbados Revenue Authority. So therefore, there's no oversight as it relates to the collection of the fuel tax. Right? I spoke in another forum that the fuel tax is really and truly a tax on importers, right? Importers, not really at the pump. And I'm going to highlight what I'm saying to you, the people of Barbados on the screen, so that you can read uh, for yourself what I am saying about the fuel tax, right? <clears throat> the fuel tax, again, is a tax where you don't have much accountability going on. And why I say that is because the Barbados Revenue Authority does not collect, it does not collect the fuel tax, right? Saul and Robis are the ones who collect the fuel tax in Barbados. 
So the fuel tax goes straight to, to Saul and Robbie. To sorry, call it not Robbies, <laughs> but Saul and Rubis, right? There's no way to account for that money, that, that gas tax. If it is being collected by Saul and Rubis and not the Barbados Revenue Authority. Right? <clears throat> so again, you add in layers that there's no trend. So if the government increases the fuel tax over again, we have to rely and depend on the financial statements of Saul and Rubis to be able to see what the fuel tax is making. So on now to the same tax that is being charged. But before we go on to that, I want to show you guys the legislation. Again, the legislation surrounding the fuel tax in Barbados. Right? And I hope I hope you're getting me. I hope you're getting me good here. The fuel tax legislation in Barbados. I hope you are following me. Just give me a signal. Let me know that you are with me. But good night to you all. Let me slow down and acknowledge uh, some additional persons because we are getting uh, some foot traffic here. We, we have 219 persons. So I want to welcome you all uh, to Alternate Views this, this evening. Uh, we're saying Adrian X. Um, good night to you. Total niceness. Um, good night to you as well. Good night to David. Good night to Mysterious. Good night to Joy Ann. Faith. Alice Murray. Good night to you. Good night to PLS. Dem. Uh, welcome. Uh, Mysterious. Again. <laughs> uh, Marcia Esther Blue. Welcome. Marion Griffith. And as I said, Adrian Hines. Gail Biz. Philip C. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Welcome to you all. We were we were following on from a brief video from the prime minister uh surrounding this her budget and um, we we're beginning to address some of what was said in the budget <clears throat> from a pure economic uh perspective now what you have here on the screen is the fuel tax legislation because i'm attempting to explain <clears throat> why all of these taxes that the prime minister recently put on us in a previous budget, why these taxes lack accountability and transparency, and it will be an absurd action on the people of Barbados to increase these taxes where there's zero levels of accountability and oversight, where the people can see directly how much tax collection was made in their name. <clears throat> the three taxes that I spoke about, the garbage and sewage tax, the fuel tax, and the tax that manages the BTMI and how the BTMI is financed and how these three taxes are particularly being collected off the books and off budget <clears throat> and therefore the people cannot see directly how much the taxes are being made we now have to rely on the financial statements of the BTMI to see how that departure tax was collected we have to wait on Saul and Rubis's financial statements to see how much the fuel tax has been collecting. And we have to wait on the financial statements of the Barbados Water Authority to be able to see how much of this. But before, previously, BRA or the Barbados Revenue Authority <clears throat> was the sole entity responsible for tax collection. So now with the imposition of the IMF program, we are seeing a change any channeling of tax collection and how more private entities are being used to do tax collection as opposed to the Barbados Revenue Authority. <clears throat> so what we have here on the screen, right, is the Fuel Tax Act of 2018. And this act is saying, the bill would provide for the imposition of a tax known to be a fuel tax, right? We're going on to page two. <clears throat> it gives you different interpretations or whatever. So let me just read for you here what it says. <clears throat> and I hope you can see it very clearly. Or you can see the, the pieces of legislation very clearly. But it says here, <clears throat> it says here, 
the interpretation of it that controller means the controller customs and importer means a person who imports products into Barbados for resale, petroleum products for resale, and petroleum products described in the schedule meaning gasoline, diesel, and kerosene. <clears throat> so the Fuel Tax Act speaks to the imposition of the tax and it says, subject to this act, they shall be charged on petroleum products a tax known as a fuel tax, right? This is a tax that the Prime Minister said we paid at the pump, right? <clears throat> Remember that this is a tax they said we paid at the pump. Okay, so it goes on to say that the tax referred to in subsection one shall be charged at the point of importation of the petroleum products at the rate specified in the schedule, <clears throat> right? The rate specified in the schedule. Hear what I say, what it said, at the point of importation. And the minister made with order amend the schedule, right? An order made on the subsection three is subject to negative resolution. Negative resolution simply means that you can table it in parliament and it does not have to go to any parliamentary debate or discussion. <clears throat> I am asking you, the viewers, to tell me <clears throat> where in this piece of legislation, where in this piece of legislation are you seeing anything about a tax at the pump? Or where in this piece of legislation are you seeing that the individual taxpayers have to pay a fuel tax? It clearly says that the imposition of the tax, the imposition of the fuel tax is to go on the importation, the point of importation of the fuel. <clears throat> it goes on to say here, and let me zoom in some more that you can see that. Right. right here, imposition of tax, right? It is right here for all and sundry to see that the imposition of the fuel tax is being imposed only on the importers and at the point of importation of people who import petroleum products, right? So I am saying to you, people, if you listen to the rhetoric of the Prime Minister, <clears throat> they told us they were removing road tax. So we fell for the trick that we were no longer going to pay road tax. And the tax was moved and we were told as a, as a public that we were supposed to pay a tax at the pub. But this piece of legislation here, which is the fuel tax, which they pass, clearly says nothing about a tax at the pump. It speaks to the persons who import petroleum products. A piece of vital information, the Barbados National Oil Company Limited is the sole importer of petroleum products, which is the government. So the government are the ones who import kerosene, diesel and gas so any logical person with no ask well if the government is putting the fuel tax on the importers of fuel but the government in itself is the sole importer of fuel then why would the government tax itself in terms of importation why would the government tax itself in terms of being the sole importer why would they do that Right? And the simple reason is, if you tax yourself, you can increase the price that the people would have to pay at the pub. So the high price of gasoline that we are paying, right? The high price of gasoline that we are paying comes from the fact that the government put the fuel tax on itself, i.e. being the importer of fuel and built it into the price mechanism so that when you go to pay at the pump, you essentially have to pay more for gas at the gas station. Right? This tax is then collected by Sol and Rubis and is then managed by Sol and Rubis. Right? Again, off, off budget, off books, so the public cannot see, therefore, what 
the fuel tax is collecting. Because as far as we know, the government said to the entire public that they were putting a tax at the pump. But it is clear from this legislation here, and I have not moved it for reason, it is clear from this legislation here that it was clearly not a tax at the pump, but it's meant to be a tax on the importer of fuel, and the sole importer of fuel is the government. So I'm hoping you guys understand this. Right? Look at it. Who it says here, payment of tax. Every importer, right? Look at right here. Every importer shall, upon the removal of petroleum products from a warehouse, pay the controller of customs the tax, i.e., the fuel tax. So I hope I'm not losing you, my people. I hope I'm not losing you here, my people. Now, as you guys know, uh, the Prime Minister in her budget kind of, you know, tried to, to hit at me and, and, and speak about uh, you, my, my university outlook and I think, but I know for a fact that my university education was not wasted. And I know for a fact that I got this good at maths. <laughs> so my mask is telling me that the massive increase in prices for gas comes from the fact that the fuel tax was put on the importers of fuel, which is the government, who then pass on that 40 cents tax onto the gas station. And that is why the reason so many gas stations around Barbados are shutting down. Because the government built in an additional fuel tax on itself as a sole importer and has attempted to pass on has attempted to pass on that built-in increase 40 cents per liter to the to the to the gas distributors or e solar rubies and solar rubies will essentially pass on that tax to us at the pump which massively jacks up the price on top of that tax we pay excise tax and we pay value added tax and then there's something called a CIF rate. So these four taxes compounded together is the massive reason there's a big difference in fuel prices between the import price and the retail price at the pump. And as I clearly explained to you, it stems from the fact that the government is adding layers and layers of taxation and increasing the price. And therefore, the rewards of the fuel tax at the pump have been massive. To date, the collection of the fuel tax has been between 400 to 500 million dollars since 2018. Right? Since 2018. According to Clay Maskell, the garbage and sewage tax is making 80 million dollars a month. According to the to the BTMI and, and, and sources, the departure tax and these taxes on tourism are yielding close to ninety million dollars. So so these are way above the projections, and that explanation that I just gave you there is the very simple reason why there are no new taxes in Barbados, because. The highest levels of tax revenue has been collected from this government in any administration whatsoever we had in Barbados. The highest levels of tax revenue. And as you hear the governor of the central bank constantly saying that we have been benefiting from the inflation dividend in Barbados. The inflation dividend in Barbados. Right? So bear with me people tell me if you can hear me well um i'm getting a bit of static coming on my end just one moment let me clear that up
Yes, uh, much better now. So as I was saying before, the reasons why there are no taxation or no new taxation is because the current level of taxation are abnormally high. They can't go any higher. So we've been paying the highest levels of taxes ever in the history of Yeah, so I just having a bit of a challenge here with the, the volume. Um, yes, as I was saying, <clears throat> um, the levels of revenue, tax revenues, are at the highest they have ever been in the country. And the IMF is saying to the government that the levels a taxation that you're charging are at the optimal levels <clears throat> so therefore you should more focus on expenditure reduction and that particular expenditure reduction somebody's saying no song yes well what, what i'm going to do i'm going to try because <clears throat> persons are saying the song is not good um so what i'm going to do is i am going to bring my other can you hear me well just let me know if you can hear me um trying to get the volume I think i don't know if my device is volume is not good all right, right. but it should be good now yes uh, technology you know how it goes but yes <clears throat> my apologies as i was saying earlier you continue to pay these high levels of taxes and it gives the prime minister the impetus to come to the public and say that there will be no new taxes part of the agreement with the imf allow the government to implement in the mini budget hoping you guys can remember the mini budget the mini budget allowed the government to add 300 million dollars in new taxation you heard me well, $300 million in new taxation. So that $300 million that came in new taxation with the mini budget gave us what the IMF would call a primary surplus, which says that government has earned at least 6.5% more revenue over the level of expenditure. So as you know, governments usually spend, you know, governments usually spend much more than they earn in revenue and usually borrow the rest. Since about 2017, and a lot of persons don't know or don't like to tell this story, but since 2017, the government of Barbados was running primary surpluses on the books. Right? 
So these permit surpluses and a permit surplus is just government revenue minus what they spend, what they earn minus what they spend. So what government was earning was a surplus. They were not running uh, primary deficits on the percentage. Percentage was actually running a primary surplus of 3%. And that was around $300 million that Chris Sinclair was earning in excess revenue in terms of primary surplus. So when the administration came in and signed on to the MF program, this mini budget essentially added on an additional $300 million in taxation, new revenue measures, right? And in the IMF reports, the IMF constantly said that government overshot its revenue targets, which means that they did and they collected more revenue than expected. So the government has a lot of leeway as it relates to offering tax relief on a primary surplus basis. Right? They have scope to do it because, again, I told you what the IMF said. I told you what the numbers said. Right? So that process in terms of reducing government expenditure, we are continuing that this year. Majority of government's expenditure, as you know, comes from transfers to state-owned enterprises. So the money that government gives over to the water authority, the money that government gives to the hospital, the money that government gives to all of these type of institutions, um, all of that is supposed to be cut. All ministries, expenditure is set to be cut. That is what was agreed with the IMF. However, our budget shows a reverse. Our government is seeking to increase government spending with no new taxes. <laughs> Remember, all additional spending must be accounted for either by one taxation or by borrowing or by revenue coming from the primary surplus, which means that we had to earn it. We didn't earn it. We are not raising any taxes, so we have to borrow it. Right. So that is basically the premise that our budget is set on when you hear the concept of no new taxes. Simply, there is no new taxes because we are at optimal revenue levels. Our revenues are performing much better than expected. While the government is cutting government expenditure at the same time while still borrowing additional monies. So that is why you will hear the government speaking about fiscal space, fiscal space, fiscal space. We are creating fiscal space in the economy because we are borrowing. We are going to increase revenue through existing taxation, as was said by the Prime Minister. No new taxes, while cutting expenditures and reducing the budgets that are allocated to ministries. So I hope, really hope that you, you, you grasp the concept as to why there will be no new taxes and why you will hear the government saying fiscal space. Good night to you, Miss Miller, Cecilia Miller. Thank you for tuning in to Alternate Views. Um, welcome, 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 Joseph Kildagan. We are at 309 persons. I really hope that you're following this discussion keenly. I really hope that I'm not losing uh, any of you. We have Adrian saying that, asking when was the mini budget. The mini budget was rolled out in 2019, I believe. Um, I think I have my dates right. It was around 2018 where the government uh, was implementing those taxes. I am looking for the work plan. Right? So under this book plan, I have this written in alternate views. So, so for those persons who have a copy of it, you can follow. And it says, proposed measures to implement the BERT plan. Addressing revenue generating measures to implement the BERT plan. It was announced that one, the removal of the NSRL from June 1st, 2018, which was expected to cost the government approximately $145 million of their revenues. Hence, he claimed that when NSR was put on, 
Many prices rose by double digits. Depressing economic and domestic transactions and economic activity. And it was expected that with the removal of the NSRL, this would have led to a reduction in prices for the average Barbadian. Well, the Social Partnership and Free Trading Commission have agreed to monitor this situation in the private sector, which later declared that the high prices of their commodities were not attributed to the implementation of the NSRL and therefore prices did not drop. <clears throat> As was mentioned, the fuel tax, which was intended to be 40 cents per liter, and they, and they deceive, I will use the word deceive because it was marketed to the public, even in manifesto, that the fuel tax was intended to be a tax at the pump, and we would do away with, with road tax, which was set at a different rate. The government moved the income tax bonds, if you remember. Uh, the government actually increased income tax up to 40%. Those persons who receive less than 25,000, they remain tax free. And income between 25,000 to 60,000 continue to attract a tax rate of 16%. And those persons who paid, who have incomes of 60,000 to 75,000, you attracted a tax rate of 33.5%. So those tax measures were intended to raise 41 million. Let's not forget that the government wrote off all taxes owed to it from between 1968 to 2000, and the Barbados Revenue Authority wrote off all outstanding taxes that was owed to it by the time. That significantly increased what the government would call the fiscal space in that they just did not have to pay back. Or, sorry, they not pay back. But the money they were intended to collect through the Barbados Revenue Authority, they just wrote it off and labeled it as uncollectible. Corporation tax, the government was expected to raise $57 million in a year by shifting the corporate tax rate from 25 to 30%. However, no, in the last Prime Minister's budget, she reiterated that the international tax rates for corporations are now at 5%, right? 5%, some are being charged at 9%, and some are being charged at 15%. So you're saying the corporation tax rates in Barbados drop at an astronomical rate uh, as compared to other taxation levels. Value-added tax, the government put a value-added tax on all online transactions. So therefore, the persons who will shop at Amazon and online on eBay, the government trapped you. Uh, even if you have to pay for Zoom, um, the government, I'm at page 59 for those persons who, who may be following. The government actually trapped you uh, when you pay for online transactions, Zoom and everything. The government are actually saying to you that you have to pay them 17.5%. <laughs> hey. So I am saying here now, additionally, that the health service contribution uh, was added on as well. That health service contribution was intended to raise $50 million by taking 2% out of your national insurance and giving it directly over to the hospital. The same departure tax that I spoke about before, the departure tax was a plan to transition the BTMI and the Barbados Product Authority into one public private partnership. Government would obviously maintain shareholdership, but that was intended to be funded by the US $70. A uh, fee for persons traveling outside the CARICOM, the airline travel and departure fee, they call it, and a US $35 fee for persons traveling within CARICOM. It said that that tax measure was intended to raise $95 million, with $75 million of it going towards the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Like, so, so you see any levels of revenues that the government collected $300 million worth. It also implemented the room rate levy 
on Airbnb and other type initiatives. Right? And in addition, the, the minister, which is the Ministry of Finance, announced um, Yes, the Ministry of Finance announced that they would have put a 2.5% product levy on all accommodation services and a 10% well, on all accommodation services. Right? And they said that these measures, again, were intended to raise, these were rate levies were intended to raise $60 million. Right? So if they say that, Combining these revenue measures, including the abolition of NSRL and road tax, was expected to, expected to raise $303 million in revenues alone. Right? So you can see as far back as the 2018-2019 budget that the government was making $600 plus million. If you compare what Chris Sinclair added, you add, if you add that to what the discount government added, $600 million since 2018, and COVID hit in 2020. So let's count the years 2018 to 2019, 2019 to 2020, and 2020, which is three years. The government made, or is intended to make, make they tend to make more. 1.2 billion dollars in the first two years of revenues okay. they didn't get all the way in 2020 to make the thing so you can see that based off these early measures the government has no need to increase revenue measures on the population because they've been making significant sums of money already right okay. the challenge with this collection of tax revenues expresses itself in the fact that while the government agreed to increase the tax revenues, simultaneously they agree with the IMF to cut expenditures. Right? They agreed to cut expenditures. So in cutting those expenditures, i.e. meaning reducing transfers to their own uh, corporations reducing the wage bill the government has been dragging its foot okay we just say 1.8 billion why i did not add the additional amount is because covid hit in 2020 um so I accounted for COVID and I get I, I actually accounted for the first two years of the uh, 6.5% uh, primary surplus, which would have given you 1.2 billion in two years. But I did not add the last year uh, because of COVID. But you indeed are, are correct. The government did change the target, the primary surplus from 6.5 when COVID hit and it dropped it to negative one percent which mean which mean that the government had close to 1.5 billion dollars to spend in the barbadian economy right it had that space to spend on you right so you all saw covid uh in an attempt to resuscitate the economy during covid the government rolled out yes the government rolled out a set of plans uh a set a new set of expenditure measures when the economy went down um, i can give you a list of all of these measures um, it was announced by the government right this is in light of the mf program because it, and they have it again here alternative views i'm at page 176 now it says here that the impacts of the coronavirus at the time they were calling it <laughs> i.e covid was first recognized around March 2020. As then Health Minister uh, Jeffrey Boston announced that Barbados record, recorded its first case of the deadly uh, COVID virus, right? Many persons in Barbados believe that our economy was striking or buoyant as they would say before COVID. 
but the Barbados economy actually registered eight consecutive periods of economic decline before COVID. So the economy was not growing at all. The economy did not grow between 2018 and COVID. It has 0% growth. It declined every financial quarter straight up to COVID, right? And you heard the prime minister and all the ministers speaking about growth uh, in the Barbados economy. Meanwhile, you had eight consecutive periods of economic decline while being in a rigid IMF program. Right. I said earlier that on the revenue side, the Barbados government, this current administration, collected the highest levels of taxation in the history of the country through garbage and sewage tax on the water bills, increases in land taxes, increases in the fuel gas tax, the departure tax, the hotel room tax, introduction of value added tax, and other taxes on tourism offerings, increases in bus fares. Right? A lot of persons forget increases in bus fares along with the broadening and the VAT base. At that time, we had the emergency management COVID directives in place. And at that time, there were serious limitations on movement, i.e. lockdowns, restrictions on businesses were in place. And many, many existing restrictions occurred within the Barbados economy at the time. Right? And there was a proposed package rolled out called a stimulus package. And this stimulus package intended or it was the economic plan intended to fill a hole of nearly two billion dollars over two years so for that extended period of time there was a two billion dollar hole that needed to be filled in the barbarous economy and this plan was put forward <clears throat> now some of the key measures of the government at the time well they had people in quarantine <laughs> uh they wrote out something called a uh, if employees, this, they call it the National Insurance Scheme Support Program, and the government sought to provide supplemental support to the National Insurance Unemployment Fund as needed within the context of available, again, here the word coming up, fiscal space. So as you know, many persons during COVID at the time were sent home, lost jobs, government sent me and on top of that the ash was, was going on so so you had to find means and ways to support the unemployed at the time those included policies of unemployment benefits so those persons who were laid off fully will receive unemployment benefits for six months and those on short weeks will receive 60 percent for the days they were not working <clears throat> bank financing all commercial banks according to the government um Agreed to a six month, right? Agreed to a six month payment moratorium on existing loans and mortgages for persons and businesses directly impacted by COVID, right? You then had what you call a homes for all program, homes for all program, and this homes for all program, i.e., the whole project, which was spoken about by the prime minister. In her budget, who's saying that the whole project, there will be an investigation into the whole project. So part of the fiscal measures for COVID were indeed a homes for all program. And it said that the government is set to use 50 million Barbados dollars in the housing credit fund to unlock a further 200 million of financing from the banks in Barbados to help over 1,000 households construct our own an affordable home. And this project was initially targeted at persons with a household income of $4,000 per month. <clears throat> that is the whole project, right? So there you have the government in a financial crisis struggling for economic activity, parceling off 50 million dollars they claim but i heard it was increased to 60. so 60 million dollars the government rolled out in a homes for all program as an economic stimulus <clears throat> to help drive economic activity and to meet the need of housing to unlock what they claim as 200 million 
from the banking sector in Barbados to construct these houses. What's interesting about this stimulus package is that this particular stimulus package by the government at the time, the Emergency Management Act allowed the Office of Prime Minister through the amendments that were made, which says that cabinet now has any authority to make whatever decisions necessary for the good governance of the country. And then the next line item said that cabinet now vests any and all authority into the Office of Prime Minister. So therefore, the office of prime minister, here, here the terms are used, the office of prime minister, not the individual, but the office of prime minister issued the emergency management directive to go ahead and undertake the homes for all program, which took $60 million out of the housing credit fund as like a, a guarantor or so to be used to unlock $200 million in financing to facilitate the whole project. So again, in this year's budget, you have the Prime Minister of Barbados speaking about hope and the opposition leader of Barbados, uh, Ralph Thorne, he asked about the disbursement of that money from the housing credit fund. Okay. In this year's budget, again, the Prime Minister referenced the whole project and said that there will be an accelerated push to build the 10,000 houses that were promised to the population. I promised an investigation, but given the facts that I just explained that the whole project was rolled out under the Homes for All program, which was rolled out under the COVID management directives, which was a direct order or directive issued from the Office of Prime Minister, which means that the Office of Prime Minister, who were the ones who issued the directive to go ahead and take up the money from the Housing Credit Fund, we have the Prime Minister of Barbados suggesting that they will undertake an investigation as to what is going on in Hope. And that is what we mean when we say transparency. That is what we mean when we say accountability. <clears throat> but let's not venture too far into Hope as we know that uh, Hope was indeed um, hopeless. There was a program rolled up called the Household Survival Program. Um, the Household Survival Program injected $20 million, uh, which was put there to, asset, to assist displaced workers, those being laid off who would have been entitled to unemployment benefits. We had the Welfare Support Program, uh, where as a result of COVID, where household was, was left with no person unemployed the government provided a minimum income to persons who were left unemployed. Um, that program rolled out what you call a $600 grant. So persons in Barbados were receiving $600 a month in grants uh, from, the, from the Prime Minister's office, really, actually, <clears throat> uh, as, a, as a stimulus, like a universal type basic income uh, stimulus to keep persons who had one or no persons in the household uh, being employed. We had the Adopt a Family Program, where the government is working with persons who have been fortunate to be earning more than $100,000 a year to adopt a vulnerable family and provide them with very much needed support of Barbados $600 a month. All right, so there were two $600 uh, programs a month. You had the NAS deferral program where employers who are retaining more than three quarters or, or two thirds of their staff complement was able to defer employee contributions to the national insurance for three months in the first instance and another three months if necessary. <clears throat> Government sought to refinance the small hotel investment fund with $20 million to allow for hotels to borrow and blend with other funds and refurbish their properties during the down period. <clears throat> So you see government in attempting to, to stimulate economic activity, putting $20 million in the hotel industry. <clears throat> and it was intended that these persons would have paid $3.5 million in interest uh, to the small hotel fund. It was said that by the prime minister that she hoped that the private sector would be inclined to keep staff on board, saying that this is largely new. And she will announce a series of measures that will inject Barbados 215 million dollars 
and a Barbados $200 million fund being mobilized on condition that we hold as much staff and jobs as possible at the time. The Prime Minister of Barbados said that the private sector was also expected to contribute $800 million in investments due to the start of six major projects in the next two years, noting that those projects are the $400 million Sam Lars Castle project, which has now been completed, the crane, and a $25 million improvement in the Apes Hill golf course. She also said that $60 million expansion of sandals at Dover was set to occur. The $200 million Sajikar Retirement Village, which was constructed and is very nice, I actually went there, <clears throat> along with the Barbados $400 million Hayat Ziva, which was set to begin since the Democratic Labour Party was in. And as we see, every budget since 2018, uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados promised a start date to the Hayat, uh, which has not been started as yet. <clears throat> and therefore, uh, we are having challenges with seeing the Hayat being constructed uh, as, as, as was promised in previous budgets before. Um, in this new budget, a couple of hotels were promised. Uh, the Royal Pemberton, it is called. Um, uh, at least four other hotels. So uh, let's just see how that hotel investment goes. Um, really, really and truly. Uh, 200 beach vendors um, were set to benefit from a $600 per month also mitigation unit. <clears throat> and at last, as you can recall, the large chunks of government revenue being lost at the time the Prime Minister engaged the expertise to sit on a jobs and investment council, which was set to create 20,000 jobs in Barbados, including the former Democratic Labour Party Finance Minister Chris Sinclair, Who's now working in Washington at the at the World Bank, <clears throat> and it also included the former uh, finance and economic affairs uh, prime minister Onafa, along with six other persons who were intended to bring twenty thousand jobs back to Barbados. Since then, the former prime minister Onafa has died, and Mr. Sinclair, as was announced, has gone off to Washington, uh, doing his new his new duties. Uh, we are yet to see the promised investments from as far back as 2018, 2019 materialize uh, in Barbados <clears throat> when economic conditions were much better than they were uh, right now. So, my people, I am hoping that you are following keenly, following closely. Um, don't let me just ramble. Give me some 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 you know slow me down if you think that i'm getting a little bit out of hand uh, just letting you know that we are only going for a short show this evening we are not staying the the, the full time this evening uh, we are going to at least spend uh one hour and a half so we're going to round up we're going to uh wind up eventually very soon as technology is not being our best friend uh, this 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 evening so <clears throat> i hope that i gave you quite an understanding as to what we are facing i would like to have a um, couple of you signing on to the program this evening so i would very much love for some of you any of you to to, to sign on to the program um <clears throat> I want to hear from you. Uh, any comments? Whoa, they're having some serious challenges here.
Yes, my apologies, people. The volume is is not. Yes, uh, unfortunately, our viewers, we're gonna have to bring this evening's stream to a short end. Um, the technology is not working very well, and therefore, uh, we will not be able to proceed um, as planned. Uh, but nevertheless, I think we got in quite a bit of information this evening. So I would urge you to tune in next week again as we attempt to do it uh, once more, <clears throat> where you can have the information brought directly to you, uh, the people of, of, of Barbados. So I really hope that I would have opened your eyes to uh, some of what <clears throat> queries you had, some of what challenges you had, I hope you got some transparency and some additional information as, as it requires these taxes. Uh, EZD, um, you're saying that I, I was on point about the garbage and sewage tax uh, collection. Yes, uh, we usually bring the facts. Um, <clears throat> Colin Roach, I am going to do a show especially for you on uh, banking as I have publicly called for a, a national development bank of Barbados and let me just say I'm not speaking about uh I'm not speaking about a commercial bank but a national development but I have given my support to that publicly and I will do a show specifically on banking as you would have known my uh way would have pursued that university was really banking and finance right and and that is my uh pet pet area so I will do a show specifically on that. Uh, but as for this afternoon, I said the technology is not being our friend, so we will bring the show. Yes, people, I, as I said, the technology is not being very nice tonight. Um, so we're going to try to, 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 to wind down and get this, this stream off. It's cutting up. I really don't, I'm not sure uh, what is happening here. Um, so we're going to try to wind, wind down and ask you to tune on uh, next week uh, because the, the technology is really, really giving some trouble. My apologies. Uh, we are going to be back uh, next week. So thank you very much for tuning in. I really enjoyed the short time I had with you. Uh, we're going to rectify the issues and hopefully we'll be back on 
next week. So thank you very much. Alternate views. Uh, have a good night, everyone.